Well, good morning, Redeemer Church. Come on, we're going to worship the Lord this morning. Would you stand with us? We're going to put our hands together. We're going to clap this morning and worship. I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. Those of you joining online, come on, you can sing with us too. No matter what it costs so Now full 
only forgive him, my life is filled with grace is undeserved. For mercy that flowed down that sacred hill, let praises now return. Rise up, my soul, and bless the Lord, who else is worthy? All my boast is in Jesus, all my hope is his love, and I will glory forever in what the cross has done. Oh, praise the one forever blessed, him alone my heart adores, and I will boast in nothing less than the love of Christ my Lord. Oh, praise the scripture here this morning. It's from Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Come on, I was reading, even in Luke, he says daily, daily take up his cross. And we are to daily take up our cross and follow Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing through this next song, but we're going to surrender afresh this morning to the Lord. We're singing about what he's done for us on the cross. And our only response to that could ever be, Yes, Lord, here is my life. Have it all. You can have my heart. I surrender afresh this morning. And all to Jesus I surrender all to Jesus, I surrender. 
surrender all to you. We surrender afresh this morning. We surrender afresh to you this morning.
around, church, I'm just going to encourage you to lift your hands right now this morning in worship. I want just to sign a surrender to the Lord. That's why we do this. Come on. We're surrendering, surrendering our lives and our hearts to the Lord. Just as an act of surrender, let's lift our hands to the Lord this morning. Just surrender afresh this morning to say, God, you can have it all. Just sing your song for a moment to the Lord this morning. Lift up your song of hallelujah. Lift up your song of praise and thanks for all he has done. Hallelujah, Jesus, we surrender all. We call you master. We call you savior. Savior, savior, beautiful savior. We surrender afresh this morning here in your presence. Here in your presence, here in your presence, his presence is here this morning. His presence is here this morning. Here in your presence, oh God. Here in your presence, your grace, your mercy, your goodness, your faithfulness. We surrender afresh. We surrender afresh. We surrender. Come on, some of you are surrendering for the first time this morning. You're surrendering to the master, to the savior, to the redeemer. Come on, he's calling your name this morning. He's calling your name this morning. He's calling you. He's calling you out of darkness. He's calling you this morning. You're going to surrender afresh. Surrender your life. Give him your heart this morning. You'll never look back. You'll never look back. You'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. Surrender to the master. Surrender to the master. Surrender to the master. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. Take it all. Take it all. in Isaiah, he will renew our strength. We can't do it without him. But if you're waiting, if you haven't had a clear no, because we all know when God says no, but if you're waiting, wait on the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just respond to that for a moment and 
Let's just bow our heads and maybe that resonates with your heart here this morning that there's something that's going on. Maybe it's something that just happened this week. Maybe it's something that's been going on for months or years. But let's just bow our heads and respond to that here this morning. And I'm going to pray a general prayer, but you know what that thing is. Maybe even as Marianne was just kind of sharing that, that word of encouragement here this morning, there is something that's coming to your mind and your heart of saying, Lord, yeah, I need to trust you in this. I need to rely upon you. And so let's pray here this morning. Lord, we thank you that your presence is with us. Lord, we thank you that in the midst of worship, of giving you praise and glory and honor, there's something that you stir and work in our hearts. And Lord, I pray for, for those this morning, Lord, that we find ourselves in seasons, Lord, where there's some uncertainty or it just seems like there's so much opposition, but it's waiting on a move of you, Lord, waiting on your strength, waiting on your grace to empower, to give wisdom, to lead and guide. And while, while we rely upon you, Lord, we also ask for that strength to do what you call us to do in the midst of that waiting. Because in the midst of the waiting, it's not just sitting back and doing nothing, but it's continuing to be in prayer. It's continuing to be in your word. It's continuing to worship you and, and find that strength through the work of the Holy Spirit within us to wait and to trust your leading and your guiding. And so, Lord, I pray that you administer here today in a way that only your spirit can, Lord. In your name we pray. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God one more round of applause of worship here this morning. And then why don't you greet two or three people as you're seated, find a face that you don't recognize, introduce yourself to them, and then you can be seated here this morning. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to uh, Redeemer. So glad that you're joining us here today. And if you're joining us for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. I want to invite uh, you to connect with us in a real simple way. And there's a connection card in the chair in front of you. We'd love for you to take a moment to fill out. In a few moments, you can drop it off in, our, uh, in the um, offering buckets as they're passed, or better yet, as you leave. Um, to the left, as you go out the back doors uh, today, there's some next steps tables, and uh, we have our welcome team there. They, you can drop off the uh, connection card there and receive a gift as you go here uh, this morning. So, Redeemer, let's give a warm welcome to those that are our guests here today. So glad that you're with us. Um, also, if you're newer to the church, we have our essentials classes uh, rotating through with each week. So today is class two. You can jump in at any point in the rotation. Um, and so today is class two right after this service in our family room, the room uh, at the top of the ramp. And so join there. Next week will be uh, week three. Then we'll take a break. And then starting in the beginning of May, uh, we'll start with the first class again um, on Sunday. So just want to make you uh, aware of that. Also, this is kind of a, a relaunch weekend for our small groups. We had our small group term in the winter uh, where we all did the same study on developing a servant's heart. And um, some of those small groups, most of those are continuing on. Some new ones will be starting. So I want to just encourage you and point you to our uh, app and the website to search through small groups, get connected, build some of that fellowship and community as you go through, uh, you know, maybe a, a book study or a Bible study, just some of that fellowship. And so um, download our app if you haven't had it uh, downloaded already, and you can search through uh, the days and the weeks and the times and stuff like that. And also periodically go back. I know there's a few groups that I'm going to be adding over the next several weeks here, and so it's a great way to connect and build that uh, biblical community, one with another in that fellowship. And so, um, also, I uh, just want to make you aware, you know, some of you may have walked in, may have noticed, may have not noticed, there's some renovations going on to the lobby, some changes that are going on, that big kiosk in the middle is gone, but we do have a bake sale that's set up for our youth there, there's also some uh, women's ministry uh, merch that's being sold, um, just highlighting the uh, retreat and things like that that's going on, so there's a lot of activity going on in the lobby uh, after service today. And then finally, last announcement is right after service, if you are a parent of, uh, of a child that's in Uptown, our, our Vacation Bible School will be taking place this summer. 
And uh, Pastor Mike's going to have a quick meeting uh, with parents after service down in the Uptown Wing just to talk about the vision and just the, um, just the, the purpose and the intent for VBS and the opportunity inviting others out and, and being able to get connected with that. So um, that's going to take place after service down in the Uptown Wing before you pick up your children. Also, there's going to be a drawing as parents if you attend that meeting. Make sure you fill out a little slip to enter into a drawing for uh, six uh, uh, water safari tickets um, that will be given out uh, just out of a drawing there in attending the meeting. So that'll take place uh, right after the service. At this time, I want to invite the welcome team to come and let's bow our heads in a word of prayer as we honor God with our giving. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to continue to worship you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to come together each, each weekend, Lord, in the fellowship one with another, Lord, worshiping together, looking at the word together, but also the opportunity to give together in the tithes and the offerings, knowing that there's something that you're doing in each and every one of our hearts and trusting you as the provider of all, but there's also that spiritual act of worship and honoring you and bringing forth the tithe and the offering That's that, 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 that we see there in scripture and also as a community as we bring it on to you, Lord. And in coming into the local church, we see ministry go forth. It's a partnership of the gospel, Lord, whether it's, whether it's things like VBS or youth ministry or, or women's retreats, men's retreats, or it's outreaches that are taking place local or, or, or abroad with our global partners, Lord. We thank you for that opportunity, Lord, that we can um, take part in, 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 in the message of the gospel going forth and hearts and lives being touched and transformed by the preaching of your word, Lord, and by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we give you the glory and the honor here this morning. And everyone said, amen. Maroon bucket is for the tithe. Green bucket is offering bucket for our care ministry. So that'll be passed along various ways to give uh, there online. Let's take a look at the weekly, and then we're going to hear from our lead pastor, Pastor Mike. Welcome to Redeemer. My name is Bethany, and you're watching The Weekly, where we take some time to fill you in on what's going on around here. Everything we do here is centered on our mission, to help people experience the transformational power of the gospel. If you're a guest here at Redeemer, make sure you stop by the Connection Center after service for a free gift just for you. We've got some awesome stuff coming up this week. Let's check it out. Hey ladies, registration is now open for this year's Women's Retreat and you do not want to miss it. We will be returning to the beautiful Camp of the Woods in Speculator on May 3rd and 4th for an awesome weekend of worship, teaching, and fellowship. This is such a great time for all the women to get away for a few days to connect with each other and to connect with the Lord. For all the details and to register, go to redeemer.tv slash women. We can't wait to see you there. Hey church, if you serve or volunteer in any way here at Redeemer, we want to invite you out to a special leaders meeting with Pastor Jess Strickland on Saturday, April 20th at 9.30 a.m. right here at the Utica campus. This will be a great morning of equipping and encouragement, so mark your calendars and we'll see you there. That's it for this week. Now let's dive into today's message together. Okay, good morning. Come on, everybody, would you help me welcome all of our campuses and everybody that is tuning in online, whether it's Facebook or YouTube. And I always want to say hello to uh, the people that because of a, a sickness or a physical disability, they're not able to make it. We love you, we're praying for you, and we pray uh, God's peace and strength be with you today. Uh, if you have a Bible, um, and I think it's a great thing to bring your Bible to church, even if it's just simply on the phone, uh, if you could turn me to 1 Samuel 15... We were back in our series on 1 Samuel. We took a break. We were doing a series on servanthood, and then we had Easter. And last week, we returned uh, to this series. Um, I want to say something uh, to, to you all. I know that Easter was a big week for us, and maybe there's some people that are just joining us uh, for the second or third time. I want to let you know at Redeemer Church, the main way that we preach is what we call expository preaching. What's That's just a simple way of saying, or a complex way of saying, actually, you may have never heard that word, is that we go through books of the Bible. So we start in chapter one of a book like 1 Samuel, and we go to the very end. And one of the reasons why we do that is we want to hear God's voice as clearly as we can. 
and we want to hear it organically. I like that word, organically, from the scripture. How many like eating organic food? We want it just to, no GMOs, nothing like that, organically, right from, from the scriptures. I, I, there's nothing wrong with topical preaching or topical messages, per se, but what we have to understand, I want you to understand this, I want to help you as sheep, you know, and me as a shepherd who is also a sheep, is what happens is we're all living in the same culture, generally watching the same movies, encountering the same stuff that's going on in our world. And what happens is, if we just go by that, and we take all of our feelings, and then we just do topical messages, we can almost think like, well, everything's resonating with me, and everything's shaping me, and we never step back, I hope this is making sense, we never step back and just say, let, let's let God just speak outside of our culture, and just come in and speak what he wants to say to us and let him shape us rather than just us shaping ourselves. In my opinion, I think resonance is cheap, right? We need the Holy Spirit to come on his word and make it alive to us. The word of God is alive, but it's God's word to give and shape us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen on that? Now, uh, the reason why I say that is if you came on Easter and you heard me preach, that was probably... Uh, the most confrontational Easter message that I've ever preached in the 20 years that I've been preaching Easter. And I want to let you know that today it's going to be along the same lines of the same subject, but that's because I'm in this particular chapter of the book, not because I'm trying to emphasize something to you that I want to. It's almost like God wants to emphasize this to us. And so if you're at 1 Samuel 15, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through this chapter of Scripture, 35 verses, and I want you to follow with me. Uh, there are some very sobering, uh, very hard things about this passage, and hopefully I'll be able to, uh, to address them, okay? So here's what it is. And Samuel said to Saul, remember Saul is Israel's first king, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the word of the Lord. See, now right from the start, there's a reminder to Saul. God made you king, and he gave you a responsibility. Listen to the word of the Lord. I don't know if anybody knows this, but one of the requirements for kings where they were to write out by hand the Pentateuch for themselves. In other words, all the laws of Moses and all that, and they were supposed to keep that for themselves because they were to be led by God's laws. The monarchy in Israel was never an independent monarchy. It was a monarchy that was a representation of, who, of God and his kingship. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now, do I got everybody's attention right there? We're going to talk about that a little bit here today. It's one of those difficult passages of Scripture. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from amongst the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So what I want you to see before I even dive into my message is God's judgment, because this is what it's going to be. It's not, just, it's not just what we'd say is genocide. It's God's judgment on a people, which are the Amalekites, that God is specific and exact in who he's going to bring that judgment upon. So the Kenites departed from amongst the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah, as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Uh-oh, now we have a little diversion here. What did God say? Destroy them all. And devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. What we'll find out later is that's not true either. There were people that he did not destroy. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. In other words, they're not obeying the voice of the Lord. How many of you know partial disobedience is just a cover for disobedience? To make us look like we obey, but we're just oh, disobeying. And see, I'm, oh, so, I'm sorry, so uh, just moving along here. And so, wow, why am I, I'm, my notes are, 
And Samuel said, I'm sorry, where am I? Verse 10. Thank you, everybody. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Saul is living by his own rules, living by his own lords, he, or, by his own, being his own lord. He is his own king. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. Boy, Saul's really proud of himself. See, this is all about him and not about the glory of God. right? Why would he spare the king of Agag? It's like King Agag. It's like, see, I want to just have a royal slave here to just show how great I am. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. How many of you know you can fool people, but you can't fool God? And Samuel said, Then what is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? I mean, the sounds. I, it's obvious that you've disobeyed. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Isn't it just great what we did? We improvised on what the Lord said. We improved on it. Right? We know better than God. Like We're going to second-guess God here. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop! I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak. Then Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not head of the tribes of Israel? Isn't this what I reminded you about, Saul, right when I first started? I told you the Lord made you king, and he gave you a command. Okay? He says, And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord had sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice the Lord your God at Gilgal. Isn't it wonderful when we put spiritual wrappers on our sin? But friends, you can't fool God. Right? And this is Garden of Eden stuff, by the way. I hope, I hope we see this. Right? Where, where are you, Adam? Oh, here's what it is. It's the woman you gave me, God. She gave me the food. See, the sin always looks the same. Okay? And Samuel said, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than to the fat of rams. Can I just put that in a very simplistic way for us here today? God wants our heart, not our stuff. Right? But see, religion, and I say that religion in a negative sense, because religion can be in a positive sense, so religion puts an emphasis on the stuff and not on the heart. This is why in our area... You can go to any restaurant in Utica and they have a Lenten menu, right, that God forbid has no meat on it. So you can have a person who's living with their girlfriend committing, you know, habitual, habitual adultery, and yet that's okay. They'll just not eat meat on, on Fridays, but everything's all good because God is pleased. Now, that's not the way that it works, friends, not at all. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord... He has also rejected you from being king. Now see, I wanted to say something as we're talking about Saul's rejection here. Because if you're like me for years, when I would read passages like this, it would be confusing. I would, I would, I would conflate stuff like Paul, Saul losing his position with Saul losing his salvation. But this is so important that you all understand that there are sins that we could commit in this life that maybe could take us out of positions of ministry, that could affect our family, that could do those, those things, right? Think about the book of Revelation. If you don't stop, I'm going to take away your lampstand. But I am telling you this, that there is nothing that could ever take you away from the love of God that is in Christ, that we are always be part of God's family, right? If we, if we, follow him and serve him. There are consequences to sin, that's what I'm trying to say, that sometimes are irreversible. And so 
Uh, so Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Now it seems like Saul is repentant. He's not. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Now, just so you know, if you've been following along with this series, you know that a few chapters previous, God told Saul, because of his disobedience, that he would not have a dynasty, right? We all understand the way a monarchy works. Monarchy works as you pass the monarchy on to your kids. God says the monarchy is going to stop with you. But now what we see because of his disobedience, now the kingship has been taken away from him totally. Saul ceases to be God's king on this day. Okay? And Samuel said to Saul, so, and Samuel turned to go away, and Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he had said, watch this, it seems like Saul is repentant, right? I have sinned. Yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return me that I may bow before the Lord your God. See, Saul is more concerned with exterior or external appearances than he is about his heart. Now again, let me, let, this is, I want you to hear me on this because when we read certain passages, like for example, Hebrews chapter 12, see to it that no one is godless or immoral like Esau who for a single meal sold his birthright. And you know that afterwards, afterwards, there was no repentance found for him even though he sought it carefully with tears. And so people say, you know, so God not forgive if I repent and all that type of thing. Well, you have to, in my opinion on that passage, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. This is Pastor Mike's interpretation on this. You have to go back and you have to understand who Esau was. Esau was never a man that was concerned with the spiritual promises of God. He was only concerned with the, the physical or material blessings of Abraham. So here's how you know it. When Jacob, quote unquote, according to Esau, steals his birthright, even though he gave it to Esau, even gave it to Jacob, he's upset because what he wants is the material blessings of Abraham. But when you follow him later, what you find is when he has all the prosperity in the world, he loves his brother Jacob. He has no problem. Because when he got what he actually wanted, he didn't care about the spiritual blessing. Jacob, on the other hand, he loves the spiritual blessing. So much so when famine is coming in the land, he's like, I'm staying here no matter what. No matter how difficult things get, I value the spiritual blessing that has been passed down through generations that God has given. I'm sticking it out. Esau, he prospers so much, it takes him outside the land. And man, I'll tell you what, you'd almost think that, it, you'd almost think that Esau was was the covenant-bearing person because he's prospering, he's multiplying like rabbits, he's taking kingdoms over in Mount Seir, which is outside the promised land, but that's all Esau wanted. And so it'd be a reminder of it is, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? See, there's repentance, friends, that is, I, I don't like the consequences, I want what I want, but then there is a repentance that, like David, I have sinned against the Lord. The Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned. Lord, purge me with hyssop that I might be clean. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Lord, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy. See, that's, that's David. That's the heart of a true, true repentance. Then he said, I have sinned, honor him before the elders. So Samuel turned back and after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring, me here, bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Think about this for a minute. Think about the impression that Agag has at this point. Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again till the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. That's, that's said twice in this particular passage. You know, I just want to make this as a comment before I just dive into my message and we start moving into application. What a prophet and a leader Samuel is. 
See, he's not a prophet that takes pleasure in pronouncing judgment on people. He's a prophet that weeps as he does it. And I think of the faithfulness of Samuel's life to be, have to do this, to have to deliver God's message of judgment to people that he cared deeply about. Eli, who was like a father to him, to tell him that God was taking the priesthood away from him. And then to a man that was like a son to him, like Saul, and to weep over him and, and to see what's there, but yet to faithfully deliver the word of the Lord. And I think there's something to be said to us. And even what I'm about to preach here today, and hopefully my heart will be the same in this, is that when we go and we declare the judgment that God brings, that we do it with a heart of compassion and with a heart of, 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 of grieving before the Lord over these things rather than a sense of self-righteousness and pride. Now, the first thing that I want to think that this passage is, I'm going to move directly, okay, from this passage into application. And I think there's a couple things that are being addressed clearly for us as New, New Testament Christians that we need to take into account. How many here think it's, it's a very difficult thing to hear from at the very beginning? God goes to Saul and says, listen, go take care of Amalek. Not just Amalek, take care of the whole group of people. Men, women, children, everybody, all of their donkeys, all of their oxen, just everything. Totally wipe them out. How many of you think that's difficult? Now, I want to make sure that you all understand. I don't want to just kind of skip over that and not acknowledge that that is very difficult. And there are a lot of things I could say about that particular thing that I have questions on. But what I would say is, as a person who is a follower of Christ and a believer of the God of the Bible, that there are definitely things that are above my pay grade. Right? There are things that I'm never going to figure out that I just give over to the Lord. But this is, this is not a cop-out for me because I'm leaving, going somewhere with this. And I'm going to tell you this. But there are things that I absolutely 100% know, and the very first thing that I want to make sure you all understand and we all understand is the judgment that God brought out on the Amalekites was not instant, but there was a long, it was a long time coming. In other words, God was patient with them, wanting them to repent. See, the story of Amalek, and God brings it up, didn't happen just a few days ago or a few weeks ago. It actually happened 400 years previous. What happened was as Israel was leaving Egypt, we all have seen the movie The Ten Commandments, they're walking through the, the wilderness and they're encountering different enemies. And this passage refers to enemies and friends, Kenites who helped them, Amalekites who hurt them. Well, in Exodus chapter 17, God says specifically to Moses, this is, remember, 400 years previous, then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the, thro a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will war with Amalek from generation to generation. Okay, what, what, what happened? We'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and you'll hear exactly what happened. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and you were weary. In other words, he came in at the time when you were most vulnerable and took advantage of you. Not only did he do that, he cut, uh, cut you off at your tail and those who were lagging behind because he did not fear God. Now look, what does it mean the people that were lagging behind? I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't even think about this till just now, but I remember when I was in college, a, two of my, a friend of mine, we went out running. And another friend of ours, you know, we, we jogged for, we had this PE type of thing we had to, we had to do for our, for our, you know, points or, or credit for college. So we decided to do jogging. And so we jogged this three-mile run. And so one of our friends said, you know, we want to, we want to, I want to jog with you. And of course, he'd never jogged before. And so what happens? We start jogging and we're ahead. And what's happening? He's lagging behind. Why is he lagging behind? He's weaker than us. So it's the weak that are lagging behind that Amalek takes advantage of. He always takes advantage of the weak. Now, specifically, I want to zero in on this because I want you to hear something on me. Hear, hear something from me. God hates it. God hates it. When the strong take advantage of the weak. Do you hear me on this? God hates it when the strong take advantage of the weak. The reason why I'm pausing and saying that right here is a lot of times in church, right, there are certain sins that we emphasize appropriately. 
For example, we may emphasize that God is against immorality. And that's appropriate, right? Because Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, don't even let there be a hint of immorality amongst us. But do we understand how much God hates it when the strong take advantage of the weak? You know, I do a Bible study on Thursday mornings, and we're going through the Gospel of Matthew, and we came to what is known as the most popular scripture in the Bible. It's the most popular scripture in the Bible, but nobody knows where it's found. It's found in Matthew chapter 7. It says, judge not, lest you also be judged. And as I was talking about that, I said, let's look at that. And I took people to 1 Corinthians 5. I said, are we really not supposed to judge? Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, Jesus is actually saying, no, we got to be appropriate in how we judge. We need to consider ourselves. We're not supposed to be self-righteous, judgmental people. But 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul is dealing with an excommunication issue, he actually says to people, what business is it for me to judge people outside the church? It is our business to judge people inside the church. And in that context, he does say this, do not be deceived. Watch this. The sexually immoral will not get into the kingdom of heaven. And we always focus on that. But do you know what the Bible also says will not get into the kingdom of heaven? Swindlers. Now listen to me on this, right? This is the story that I shared with my Bible study. See, after I graduated from Bible college, I went out and got a job, and I sold cars for a little bit, for six months. About the fourth month I was there, we had a sales meeting. My general manager came in and said, listen, we want you to be aware, we've got this new program that we're offering. We're going to be doing commercials on TV and on radio for people with bad credit. Okay, so be aware, people are going to start coming in who have bad, bad credit. So we want you to understand what we're trying to do here. So what happens is, is like they're going to come in. Listen, if they say they have bad credit, listen, don't, don't, don't get, the term was, don't get sewered on them. Just come in, write the app, do all that type of stuff, you know, you know, whatever. But here is the deal. Some of them might not have as bad credit as they think that they have. Don't forget it. We were called a liner and a closer store where I would be the person that would go out, show the car, kind of demonstrate its features and all this type of thing. This guy comes on, he's like, Hey, listen, I'm looking for a minivan. He goes, I can't afford something new. I'm looking for something used. So I take him to the used car lot, find a minivan. We go on the test drive. He's driving. He's like, yeah, this is perfect. And before we even pull back into the lot, he goes, well, I got to tell you something. I got bad credit. It's like five years ago, uh, my wife went through some medical issues, and we just had a really difficult time, and it's just really hurt us. Um, I think he had said that he had declared bankruptcy, if I remember correctly. And so I'm like, okay, let's go run the app. And so we go in, my other guy, manager, takes them and serve it. I'll never forget, I'm in the sales room, and the guy goes, we got a live one. And from what I remember and what I understand is, see, from the time of his bankruptcy to where he was now, this guy still thinks that he has really, really bad credit. And if interest rates were at 6% at that time, he maybe would have qualified for 9%. Because how many of you know there's nothing wrong when you're talking about credit if someone is somewhat of a risk that you've got to take that into account? But see, here's where it's bad. Well, he may qualify for 9%, but he thinks his credit is so bad, we're going to charge him 15%. Friends, that is taking advantage of people that are vulnerable, and it is wicked in the sight of God. Now, listen to me on this. The reason why I say that is, now, I don't know all the ins and outs of how they do things, but I have known that there are people that consider themselves Christians who have Christian automobile Selling places, dealerships. And this was my experience with that whole situation. If they are advertising people for bad credit, that is the reason behind it. And I'm here to tell you that is wrong. And God hates it. And God hates it. But what I want, so just kind of moving on from that whole thing here. God hates it when the, weak, the strong are taken advantage of by the weak. Is that Okay. Should I go on on that? Should I go through the book of Obadiah and talk about the one chapter prophet in the Bible, one of the main things he talks about? God says, Edom, which is Israel's cousin, the descendant of Esau, I saw what you did. You knew that Israel was going to be destroyed, but you sat back and you said, this is going to be advantageous for us. And you allowed people to come in and plunder them because you knew you were going to get advantage. I saw it, and I'm going to judge you for that. Because why? God hates it when the weak, strong Take advantage of the weak. As a matter of fact, let me just focus here on a minute. What's the harshest scripture in the New Testament? Anybody know? James chapter 5. Woe to you, rich, 
the wages that you have held back from the poor man, what you have taken from it, your possessions are going to eat your flesh in hell. You know, you read commentators on that, and here's what they say. James isn't talking to Christians because Christians would never behave that way. And I think to myself, uh, if I could say this with all due respect, a seminary professor who's writing a commentator who is probably not involved in a local church says, have you been around church lately? Yeah, it's okay if I'm down in the south and you have all these immigrants that are coming in for me to use them to build my houses, only pay them $5 an hour or $7 an hour or I'm making three or $400,000 off of a house. Friends, it is wickedness in the sight of God. In fact, let me quote my, my, my Old Testament professor, Bruce Walkey, right here. You know how he defines, this is what righteousness is in the, in the, in the scriptures. And this is from his Proverbs. Bruce Walkey, I'm indebted to him, right? He's changed my life when it came to the Old Testament. Righteousness, here's what righteousness is when the righteous disadvantages themselves for others. Wickedness is advantaging yourself at the expense of others. And so God comes and judge, judge here. But here's the point in this whole passage, right? And we're looking at 1 Samuel. There is a time period. And what is that time period? That time period is God gives people space to repent. And you know how you know this? I want you to see this as a theme throughout Scripture. For example, go before Moses and you go back to Abraham. Remember, God gave Abraham a promise that the land that they're in were gonna, was going to be his. Why doesn't God immediately give it to him? Does anybody know? Well, one of the clues is when God is speaking to Abraham, Abraham says, listen, Abraham, you're going to die and you're not going to inherit this land. As a matter of fact, he, God tells Abraham, Abraham, your descendants are going to go over into Egypt and one day they're going to come back. But when they come back, then they're going to have the land. But watch what it says here. I want you to see this very last word. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land. Why? For the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. And what we have to realize for us, friends, God gives space for us to repent. The question is, will you receive that invitation? See, when we look at a passage like this, kill men, women, and children, does that have any bearing in the New Testament? Well, I'll tell you what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absence, to be well-pleasing to him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things that are done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we all are well-known to God, and I also trust that we are all well-known to our consciences. Now watch. Now I'm going to take you to, I'm going to read a whole passage of 1 Peter here this morning. First Peter, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 3. I want you to watch this here. I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you in the last day scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise of Jesus coming again? Before, before times are answers, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. So you see what they're saying? All this talk about judgment... All this talk about judgment, it's always been the same. It's never, ever going to happen. In other words, so, so let me just say this to all of us, right? That is going to be the feeling. That is going to be the sense that it's going to be out there. So if you're a person that's just led by your senses, just led by culture, this is what the Bible says the last days are going to be. There's going to be no knowledge, no fear that God is ever coming back to judge the world. But we as Christians, we're supposed to say, no, we defy our feelings, Right? We say no to our feelings, and we live by a greater truth. How do we know that there's a greater truth? Let me step out of Second Peter and go back to a, a scripture that I used when I was preaching on Easter. It's when Paul stood up and, and, and spoke at Mars Hill. He says, listen, listen, to you, listen to me, people. There is a time where God overlooked your ignorance, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. Why? Because he's appointed a day where he's going to judge the world, and this is the New Living Translation, with justice or in righteousness. 
And he's appointed it, and he, which he's, by a man he has appointed. It's not going to be King Saul, friends. Hello, come on, somebody talk to me here. It's not going to be King Saul. You know what I said on Easter, right? All Christians need to be aware. When we celebrate Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, and we celebrate Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus coming in on a donkey, Jesus coming humbly to be our king and to die for us. His second coming is not going to be like his first. He is not coming on a donkey. He is coming on a white horse to judge the nations. And this is what Paul says. He's appointed, and he has proved this to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. See, that's, the, that's right there. You see what it is right there? The raising from the dead. See, what I'm just saying to you is not fear-mongering. It's not me just uh, uh, presenting something out there. I'm saying, Paul says, consider that God came to earth. He provided a way of redemption for you. And he's prone at a day when he's going to judge the world. He's proven this by raising his son Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus is a risen Savior. And so, going back to 2 Peter, we're going to get to the good news here in a minute. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. So, in other words, God judges sin, right? And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for a fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Okay, do you see that? But you, you must not forget one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. So in other words, you think the Lord has forgot. You think this is a fairy tale. You're misinterpreting something. That 400 years that God waited to judge Amalek, was not God forgetting and saying, oh, I'll get to that someday. That period was a time where God was giving people time to repent. See, watch. As these people think, no, he is being patient for your sake. Now watch, here. here's the good news. God is not willing that anyone be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. See, there's things that I don't know, and there's things that I do know. And here's what I do know. God is patient. What I do know is God loves you. What I do know is that God has provided a way by which everyone can escape the coming judgment. Everyone. And you know what that escape is? When God sent his son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, and he came to earth as our substitute and as our redemption, he lived a perfect life. The perfect life you didn't live, couldn't live, wouldn't live, and aren't living. He lived a substitutionary life for you. And then he died on the cross, brutalized, took the judgment of God in totality for all of us, right? And then three days later, he rose victorious over sin and death. And you know what? The resurrection is the receipt that God accepts payment on my behalf. And what God says, you want to miss the coming judgment, right? Here's what you do. You receive the gift that I have given. Receive the gift that I have given. The gift of my son, Jesus Christ. You can either face judgment when Christ comes back, or by the way, if you die today. You know, I was telling people last night, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded, it was probably about 15 years ago, there was a wonderful man that used to attend, that attended our church. He was here on a Saturday night. He worked for the, the county. He had retired. He had built a home in South Carolina. And he had just retired, and he he was his last service in church here. He was moving to South Carolina. And he comes up to me, his name was Mike. I said, hey, Mike, how you doing? He's like, oh, man. He's like, I'm so excited. He says, they put the landscaping in on my new house this week. He's like, I'm really looking forward to get up. 55 years old. The very next day, I get a phone call. Mike died of a heart attack. He was driving to the coffee shop. It was at a stoplight and just bent over the steering wheel, and died. Do you know when you're going to meet the Lord? Whether it is coming or at his death, what I want to make sure that you all know, God is not willing that anyone should perish. Any should perish, but all should come to repentance. You can either face 
the judgment that is coming in the future, or you can put your faith in a judgment that fell for you 2,000 years ago that fell upon Christ. And when I see this here, you know what repentance is? Here's what repentance is. Yes, it's believing on Jesus, but repentance and faith are part of the same coin. Okay? They're part of the same coin. And here's Pastor Mike's definition of repentance. You've probably heard me say it a million times. But it's worth repeating. I know what the, I love the definitions, right? Repentance, it's turning, right? So if I'm walking this way in my own way, right, which is like Saul, right? I'm just doing my own thing. It's even, like, here, you know, can I just, because I'm never going to finish my message here today. I've got to be done in like three minutes. So I'm never going to get to my second point, just so, so you all know that, right? So here, here's, here, here's, what, here's what it doesn't look like. Here's, I'm Saul, right? So I'm living my own ways. I even call myself a Christian, but I'm living my own ways, right? The word of the Lord. No, I, I hear what God says, but he's, I t- I'll take that under advisement. Jesus, you can be part of my board of directors, but you can't be my CEO, Don't tell me what you believe about sexuality. I'm a modern man. Don't tell me how to run my business. Don't don't, don't speak to me about these things about charging exorbitant interest or taking advantage of the poor. I know the way that business is. Come on, let's just be practical about things. Just take it under advisement. No, 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 no. Here's what repentance is. Repentance is I'm walking my own way. Maybe I'm having a Christian rap around my life, but I'm still my own king, and I turn. Right, and what I'm, I love the thing about turn is I turn from myself and I turn to God. But I love the, the thing about direction because repentance is a continual thing that we do. We continually walk in repentance, and repentance is we're continually walking towards Christ. We're walking in His direction. But what I love, or my definition, is this: is like I take the crown off of my head. I'm King. I'm God. I know better, and I throw it down in the most extreme way. And I bow my knee before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords say, you're God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you would come for a sinner like me, a person who doesn't deserve it, a person who has rejected you, a person who, 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 who in the, shakes his fist, has shaken his fist to you. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Lord, I humbly bow my knees before your kingship. And Jesus, I receive you. I don't have nothing I bring, just open hands to receive what you have given. Well, you know, that's good news, friends. Because you could actually look forward to Christ's coming. Just like the Thessalonian church. The Thessalonian church, Paul says, and they speak of how you're looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven. Why would I look forward to God's Son? There's the terrors, right? Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, he is the one who rescues us, who rescues us from the coming judgment. Is that okay? See, let me just briefly just give you what my second point is, which is the, dom- the, the, the main portion of the passage, right? How many here know we don't have any King Agags in our life anymore? And certainly one of the things that I want to address head on, very just, let me be ready right we do not we do not fight, Christians do not fight or kill people anymore, right? That's not the way it goes anymore. We're not trying to take any land. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was of this world, my servants would be fighting, right? Pay attention to that, okay? My kingdom is not of this world. If it was of this world, my servants would be fighting. But Paul tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. What does the believer, what are the king agags in our life? You know what it is? It's indwelling sin. Romans chapter 8. Watch. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the, if, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Can I just ask us a question here today? Are we active, and here's a big word, mortifying sin in our life? We. Are we? See, let me, let me just not go to the easy one of like men that are looking at porn and all that stuff. Let me, let me not go to the easy one. Are we mortifying the pleasures of this life in us? Hello. Look. Look at me. Watch. Watch. Everybody pay attention to me, right? 
Pastor Mike, we're, we got so many events in the church. We're just, people are just way too busy. Way too busy. And Jen, you know what? Some people are. But you know, for the good majority of us, I'm like, okay, let me look at your phone. Why do you want to see my phone, Pastor Mike? Uh, let me see how much screen time you had this week. Just every week, just eight, 10, 11 hours screen time? Oh, now you're getting too personal. Do we fight against that to say, what, what am I giving myself to? Like, what am, I, what am I doing? How about my money? Like, you know, people, money, it's like, you know, my wife and I were, were talking this morning. I said, she had a conversation. I, I said, I hope you had that conversation after I preached last night because I used this illustration. Well, I can't give to the church. I can't whatever. I don't mind. Well, you got three gym memberships. Oh, yeah, you got the, the CrossFit. You got the Planet Fitness. You got the personal trainer. You got all this stuff. But, hey, you know, I, I'll give my little $20 a week to the church. Oh, too personal, Mike. Oh, no. Lord, I resist. Lord, I put to death my own fleshly desires to put you first in my life, right? Watch Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ. Are you raised with Christ? Friends, are you raised with Christ? If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things of this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Come on, praise be to Jesus. My life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Yes, I look forward to that day. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. This is your command. See, Jesus comes to us and says, did I not save you? Right? Isn't it I who saved you and I've given you commission? Put to death what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Watch. Think of Amalek. On account of these things, the wrath of God in coming, in, is coming. In these things you two once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put away all anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Put it to death. You know, John Owen, the great Puritan theologian, has this great statement. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. You know what the crazy, you know how, does anybody here know how Saul winds up dying? And a Malachite kills him. First Samuel, second, second Samuel 1 opens up where an Amalekite comes to David and says, Saul's dead, how do you know? Well, I happened to hear he was wounded in battle, battle, and he said, don't let the Amalekites get me, or the enemies get me, and so I killed him. And David looks, says, David weeps. He says, how dare you kill the Lord's anointed? And basically, like, did you not fear God? Amalekites don't fear God, right? So David has the Amalekite killed. But here's, here's the spiritual principle for us, right? The sins that we are entertaining in our life will eventually take us out. Right? You know, I read the New York Post every day. Like, not the whole thing, but I I look at the New York Post every day. And it always shocks me. It's a New York City paper. Like, it, it happens all the time. You have these people that live in Manhattan. Think about this. In an apartment in Manhattan, and they have tigers in their in their in their apartments. Tigers, alligators, dragons. Do you ever see these things? And you know how you know it? Because it never ends well. It's like, what the heck does a guy have an alligator in his apartment for? There's some crazy people out there. Well, they just had a tiger. Well, what happens is they buy it with like cute little tiger. You know? Now, let's look, look at this. I mean, like, it's harmless. So I bring the tiger, I give it its own little room over there, and the tiger just keeps getting bigger. I'm just petting the tiger, feeding the tiger, feeding the tiger. And what happens the next thing you know? It takes us out. Be killing sin, or sin will be coming, killing you. 
Friends, how many are thankful that Jesus is our king? See, in all these passages, in all these passages, what, we, what, we're, what we're looking for is we look at principles that apply to our life, but the main thing we got to say is Jesus is our king. And see, Jesus and King Saul, he will execute the word of the Lord faithfully, and he did through his life, going to the point to, to death, even death on a cross. We talked about that. But Jesus is the king of our lives, isn't he? And see, if you see with Saul's compromise, it leads the armies into compromise as well. And I'm telling you this, when Jesus comes into our heart, when Jesus comes into our life, when he's the Lord of our life, he points us always in the right direction when Jesus is king. And here's how he does it. See, through Jesus' ascension, after he rose, the Bible says that he poured his Holy Spirit upon his church. And see, this is more than just an adherence to the word of God, right? Just more than just this, to, a, to, the, to the holy book, the, the living word of God, right? The Holy Spirit comes in us. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, gives more than just giving spiritual gifts, charismatics out there. Those are wonderful. But he also gives us the, 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 the power to do what pleases God. It brings the conviction of the Holy Spirit on, the, on, the, on our lives. And we say, Lord, King Jesus... Be the king of my heart today. Holy Spirit, I don't want to grieve you, Lord. If I've done my own thing, if I've turned, Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and, and, and speak to me if there's an area of my life that I need to repent of. By the way, as I close here today, as I just said that, you do realize that time does not atone for people's sins, right? You see that, right? 400 years did not atone for it. There's only one thing that could atone for it, and that's the work of Jesus Christ. So we come to Jesus, right, in our life. Let the Holy Spirit have his way inside of us. Lord, direct me, guide me, help me. Can we just all stand to our feet as we close here today? I got to have a parents' meeting for the children's ministry. Can we all just raise our hands as we close? Is the worship team coming up? You know, there's some people, you know, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the worship team, but there's some of us, I want to invite the prayer team to come on down. If the prayer team, if you're just, I want you to come on down if you're on the prayer team. And here's what I want to tell you. As I close and I pray for you, there are people in here, you need to get your life right with God. I don't believe a prayer saves people. I don't believe an altar call, but I do believe response, right? Responding to the Lord. And there's times where we just got to get out of our seat. We say, Lord, I'm here to do business. I'm, I'm making a declaration. I'm done. I'm done with the way that I've been living my life for myself. And I want to live my life for you, Jesus. I want to escape the coming judgment. I want to put my faith in Christ. I want to dedicate my life totally to him. Father, Lord, as I said in our Easter service, Lord, you've given us the ministry of reconciliation. God is making his appeal to us, through us. Be reconciled to God. Father, while we can be distracted by what did the Bible say? Judgment on men, women, and children. And Lord, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in some ways an appropriate distraction. But we can miss the main thing because we'll never figure that whole, that, all that out, but we'll miss the main thing is that, Lord, that there is a judgment that is indeed coming. And Lord, you have told us and you have given us the solution. You have given us the answer. And the answer is your son, Jesus Christ. Father, help us. Father, by the power of your spirit, not through emotional manipulation, Lord, not even just through fear. Lord, fear is one of the things that you use. But Lord, by the work of your spirit right now, you would turn us from our destructive path to you. Lord, that we might experience the life that you bring. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If that's you, listen to me. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to sing a song. We're officially closing, but I want to ask you, come on down to the altar and receive prayer here this morning. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see, and when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me.
crown for my reward is giving glory to you. Oh Lord, please light the fire that one. church come on have a wonderful day still want to invite you to the altar if you need prayer and a reminder there is a vbs beating with pastor mike and the uptown wing if you need prayer you just want to come worship with us for another moment we invite you to the front here Yeah. 